Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and let's talk about the stomach, and we're going to focus on tumors. Now, in any part of the body, we always talk about that the success of a study depends on protocols, and in the stomach, it's no different. If I had to look at the stomach and say, what's the key things? I would say distension, opacification, how we display the images, and enhancement pattern. When you look at the stomach, the classic definition of wall thickness and a distended stomach was under a centimeter. Truthfully now, it's really under five millimeters. But again, the caveat is the stomach needs to be well distended. And here's just a good example, a nice distended stomach with water. You can see the pancreas nicely. You see the wall is barely measurable. It's a few millimeters. He, this patient, by the way, has a thickened transverse colon, but look how nice the stomach is. And when you look at the areas that are most challenging, of course, it's always going to be the gastric fundus, and it's going to be the antrum. Now, whether you're using water or positive contrast, here we're using oral omnipaque. Stomach is well distended. There's no wall thickening. There's no pathology present. There's no confusion. But if I give you this case, and I ask you, what about the stomach? Is that an understanded stomach? Or is it a gastric infiltration by tumor? Is it gastritis? What is going on? It was really normal, but you could not tell me that here. That's why when we do all of our cases, we always give water or positive contrast to distend the stomach. You get rid of all of these pseudo lesions, and your reports make some sense to say stomach can't be evaluated because it's not distended to say the stomach is not well distended, can't roll out malignancy. Those all seem to be things we don't want to be saying. What about this case? Is the stomach abnormal or normal here? I, I don't know. The stomach's not distended. You look at the coronal views, you may be to some funny vasculature there, maybe. I don't know. But you couldn't make much out of it. You couldn't say it was normal. You couldn't say it was abnormal. Here's that same patient when the stomach's distended. Now, in the prior example, I don't want you to think we don't distend the stomach at Hopkins. The patient was going for EUS f to look at a small pancreatic lesion and we couldn't give water. This how the patient looked a different time. Stomach's distended. The patient is lined by polyps. There's over 100 adenomatous polyps in this patient. They're all benign. But look how easy it is to see the polyps when the stomach is distended. When the stomach is not distended, there's no way to see them. Or in this example, is this normal or abnormal? Is this lack of gastric distension or is this pathology? Here it is on the uh, sagittal views. What's going on? Well, the technologist swore that they gave enough water. They swore they gave the last cup of 250 cc's when the patient got on the table. And in fact, this was the stomach. This patient had Zollinger-Ellison, and that's diffuse gastric wall thickening in Zollinger-Ellison disease. So it's very important to really make certain you do the protocols. I always tell the techs that no one ever got yelled at for not giving enough water. Let me rephrase that. No one ever got yelled at for giving too much water. If you don't give enough water, you know, there's no excuse. You just need to give enough water or positive contrast, whether it's oral omnipaque or it's water, you need to distend the stomach. Now, I mentioned the other area that's tricky is in the antrum, and because the stomach looks a bit thicker there, an uh, article by Pinkard many years ago made the point that 12 millimeters is upper normal, and you can see the antrum in this example. The way you can be certain the antrum is normal is that it's symmetric. When you have antral infiltration by tumor, whether it's uh, inflammatory disease or neoplasm, there's asymmetry in the antrum. When it looks this symmetric, although it looks thickened, it's not any pathology. Now, one could argue perhaps we should have distended the stomach better. That indeed might be the case, but we did. And sometimes when you do, like in this example, it's just the antrum itself. But look how nicely you put a cut plane through the antrum. You can see the symmetry. There's no if, ands, or buts. This is not pathology. The patient does not need to be endoscoped. This is normal. So the antrum is the area where we give a little bit more give. You look at the rest of the stomach, you barely can measure the wall. The antrum looks like it might be thickened, but it's just that very nice symmetry. The flip is looking at this case where you see the thickening of the antrum, and there's no mistake there's abnormal enhancement, there's irregularity, there's ulceration, there's no mistake, there's a tumor. This case also tells you another very important thing. 
When you look at the stomach, there's food in the stomach. Now perhaps you say the patient ate a cheeseburger on the way to CT. We don't put the patient NPO to fluids, but we ask him not to eat a meal for a couple hours. But you know, patients don't always follow the rules. They were hungry when they came to the hospital, ate before they got there. But when you see lots of food in the stomach, I'm always concerned maybe the patient has delayed gastric emptying. Perhaps the patient has a gastric outlet obstruction. And in this case, sure enough, it looks like diffuse thickening in the antrum. They're stranding around the antrum. And when you put this into coronal display, you see the infiltration. That's more than 12 millimeters. It's asymmetric. It's irregular. This is classic for an antral carcinoma. There's no mistake, and you're not gonna confuse this with the prior case. And if you think you might, go back and watch this in slow motion. It should not be an issue. The other thing in looking at the stomach, you often will see mucosal enhancement. If you see a break in the enhancement, you have to worry about a tumor. At times, when you have lesions in the antrum, as the prior case showed, coronal views are very helpful because otherwise you kind of get partial averaging. So you look at this example, you see the stomach, you see ascites, and I'm concerned about carcinomatosis. But in coronal view, you really nicely see the infiltration into the antrum. Much easier to recognize whether it's coronal NPR or it's volume rendering. It's very easy to take a look at that. So what's our protocol? It's either water or oral omnipaic 1,000 cc's over 20 minutes, the last cup when the patient is on the table. We always use IV contrast. Again, 5 cc's a second is ideal. You can, in theory, do a single phase at about 50 or 60 seconds to look at the stomach. That works well in many cases. But I will say that when you really want to evaluate the stomach and stage a patient with suspected malignancy, I am doing dual phase surely the first time. Now, there are some pitfalls. Here was water, and you can see the patient had eaten, and so there's some model density in the antrum. That's not pathology. That's simply residual food matter. Or in this case, the patient drank some oral contrast on the floor. The nurse gave oral contrast. They weren't supposed to. And so when you look at the images, the contrast seems to flocculate. And when you do 3D imaging, it kind of gives a very weird appearance. It almost looks like neovascularity. So indeed, you want to be very careful. If the patient ate, another example where the patient ate before, you want to be really careful. It's very easy to overcall pathology. Or in this case, the patient swallowed a pill, which could almost look like a polypoid lesion, like a small carcinoid tumor or an ulceration. But you realize it looks the same. And if you get a very nice 3D, you can see the uh, looks like a pill or it looks like a lifesaver, right? So again, potentially you can be fooled. So you want to indeed be very careful. I mentioned about the 50 to 60 second delay, do everything venous, but a dual phase may indeed be very helpful. Now, in saying that, when you're looking at gastric adenocarcinoma, venous phase is best for detection of liver metastasis. Venous phase is best for defining the presence of small nodes because you don't confuse small unopacified vessels with nodes. And arterial phase may be too early to appreciate changes in the mucosa and submucosa. And so, for example, if you look at this case, you see the arterial and venous phase imaging. The arterial shows wall thickening, so you know there's pathology present, but really the infiltration of the wall is best seen on venous phase imaging where you have more enhancement. So at times you see the differential enhancement. This lesion is fairly extensive. When the lesion's more focal, you can see in this cross section here, you see the decreased enhancement that's present, which is really easy to see here, but would be very hard to see unless you had this venous phase imaging. So again, it can be very, very helpful in that regard. In terms of protocols, whether you're 1664 or dual source, thin sections are critical because we are not only looking at axials, we're looking at the coronals particularly, but also the 3D imaging. When you look at lesions at times, the vascularity can be very helpful in defining the cause of the lesion, but it's also important to recognize there are pseudolesions. In this case, you see what looks like a gastric mass, but then there are vessels in the region outside the stomach, which look like varices, and the liver looks irregular, and the spleen is enlarged. What is that lesion? Could that be a carcinoid? Could it be a carcinoma? What is that?
Well, when you look at the images carefully, you see the patient has very large varices of the lower esophagus and the gastric fundus. And what you're really looking at are varices protruding into the patient's gastric wall and into the lumen of the stomach. This patient could easily have GI bleeding. CT is very good for looking at the source of GI bleeding. Varices may be one of the source. So when you see cirrhosis, you want to be very careful because things at the G junction fundus can easily be varices. So if you only have early phase imaging, you could potentially make a mistake in that regard. If you're uncertain, coronals can be very helpful. As in this example, it makes it very clear we're not dealing with a gastric mass like a tumor, but we're dealing with very large varices. When you do studies correctly, when you use water, in this case, when you have water and air, you can see very small gastric polyps there or here. People uh, have often used water as a contrast agent. People have also used air as a contrast agent. You can see in this case, whether you're using air or water, you see the lesions very well. Uh, we used to use fizzies, like you do a double contrast upper GI series. Sometimes patients did not particularly like that. We find that positive contrast, when it's dilute or water, works very nicely. In this case, you can see the rows and rows of polyps and this patient with a polyposis syndrome, very nicely seen. And again, here's another example of polyposis syndrome with very impressive gastric polyps. So again, the importance of distension of the stomach, whether using air or water or positive contrast, it really makes it easy for you to see the presence of disease. Now, we often do use water, and surely if I'm looking for a GI bleed, we're using water. But I could ask the question, when would water not be the agent of choice, or when is it contraindicated? Well, if you're looking for a fistula or perforation, you want to use positive contrast, you want to use oral omnipaque. Good example. What's going on in the posterior wall of the stomach? Is that a tumor? Is there a fistula? What's going on by the colon? Hard to tell with water. Give positive contrast, now you see that there's a fistula between the stomach and the flexure, the uh, splenic flexure, very nicely seen. And look at it side by side. Or this case, where you saw pneumoperitoneum and you want to know the cause, well, you see the pneumoperitoneum, but you see now with the positive contrast, you see the contrast is leaking out, and you can see exactly where the leak is in the duodenum. So if you're looking for a perforation, you want to see the site, positive contrast is really ideal. Now, another thing we've done, which hasn't really caught on in popularity, was doing the equivalent of virtual colonoscopy in the stomach with virtual gastroscopy. There have been several articles, like this one by Kim, that were very, very positive, uh, that it really gave you really good looks at the gastric folds, could pick up small ulcers, could pick up small tumors. And I like doing it. In that situation, you would try to use air for gastric distension, IV contrast for enhancement, and then could use the same software that you do virtual colonoscopy with to look in the stomach. And you can see in this case with polyposis, look how nicely you can see those polyps in 3D. Looks just like a colon. Or here, with this thickening in the antrum, you could see the inflammatory process. Worried about malignancy, these were benign gastric polyps, but you can see the detail inside the stomach or in this case of an infiltrating adenocarcinoma, which is nicely shown axially, but you put the scope inside and that's how the stomach would look. So uh, in this article by Lee and Co, they had a much higher detection rate with 3D imaging than axial imaging alone, and that was back 17 years ago. Uh, incredible results even later on, overall accuracy of tumor staging 77%, for axial CT versus 84% with volumetric imaging. So um, it seems to be better, but I have to admit it's not really caught on, and we have not been doing that for a while. Now, if we look a little bit closer at specific tumors, gastric cancer, lots of deaths, 650,000 deaths worldwide. In the U.S., the incidence has decreased over the past 60 years. It's rare before age 40, and most patients present with advanced disease even today, but with endoscopy, with earlier CT, we are picking up earlier tumors. There are certain patients who have increased risk factors, pernicious anemia, H. pylori infection increases the risk factor by, by up to six, miniaturized disease, 
or post-resection stomach cancer. So there are possibilities. There are also certain syndromes associated with increased risk of gastric cancer, hereditary diffuse gastric cancer syndrome, juvenile polyposis, poots jaegers familial polyposis are some of the syndromes. In patients with juvenile polyposis syndrome, the lifetime risk of developing GI cancers varies from 9 to 50 percent depending on the mutation. In patients with gastric polyps, it carries a lifetime risk of 21 percent. In poots jaegers GI cancers are very common. Individuals with Peutz Jaegers have a 29% lifetime risk of developing gastric cancer. And in patients with familiar polyposis, the majority of gastric polyps are non-adenomatous benign polyps, but you can see polyps in about 10% of cases which are adenomatous, which can lead to malignancy. So this familiar polyposis syndromes, if you have a patient with that, you better be very careful when you look at the stomach. Now, fortunately, polyposis syndromes are indeed very rare. When you look at gastric adenocarcinoma across the non-syndromic uh, patients, there's a, quite an even spread. It used to be that the uh, fundus had the most lesions, but now it's kind of a nice spread across the stomach. Our accuracy of staging depends on the CT protocol and interpretation. When we look at CT, we talk about the primary tumor, local spread of disease, and distant metastasis. With gastric adenocarcinoma, it can range from focal thickening to polypoid lesions to bulkier lesions with or without ulceration. We try staging tumors from T1, minimal wall thickening, T2, moderate, T3, wall thickening with spread in the perigastric region to infiltration with T4. Now, in terms of trying to pick up early gastric cancer, that's always been the challenge. If you say a well-distended stomach with gastric wall of a centimeter or greater uh, is your criteria, then it has a sensitivity of 100%, but the specificity is less than 50%, okay? Because you're going to pick up a lot of inflammatory lesions. However, if you get a little bit more specific, if wall thickening is focal, eccentric, and enhancement, it almost always means that it's a malignancy. So in this case, look at the anterior gastric wall near the antrum. There's a mass. It's irregular. It's enhancing. You can see the difference between the normal stomach and the lesion, the slight enhancement, carcinoma. This case in the body, it's very simple as well. The stomach's well distended. It's a much more extensive tumor infiltrating both anterior uh, and uh, posterior walls of the stomach. It's a real bulky tumor. You can see the ulceration present, and you really can appreciate the extent of tumor as you look through the range of multiplanar and 3D imaging. You also can see this perigastric spread of tumor. Another example, abdominal pain. This stomach is well distended. You look at the posterior gastric wall, it's about a centimeter in thickness. Here's the axial views. We go back. You see that from the GE junction down, it's diffusely thickened. That's adenocarcinoma. Again, the key was the protocol, this thickening. The stomach's well distended. If the stomach well, wasn't well distended, it'd be very easy to miss this lesion. And you could see it very nicely at the arrows, right? Beautiful example of gastric wall thickening. And compare that to the normal gastric wall uh, laterally. Okay, very, very nice example with a lot of arrows. Another case. Here we talk about what's best described as linitis plastica. You look at the stomach and you say, well, maybe it's just wall thickening or maybe it's under distension. But then you really look and you know you gave enough oral contrast. There's the fundus. And you see as you come down and you look at the coronals, there's this diffuse infiltration. Beautiful example of linitis plastica. Primary gastric cancer can present with linitis plastica. Metastasis from breast cancer can present with linitis plastica. You can see as I roam through the 3D images that lesion. Sometimes lesions are more subtle. In this case, you quickly try to go past the stomach, but you notice there's some faint thickening at the GE junction, which is often a challenging area, but there's faint calcification. Faint calcifications is never normal. We don't give positive contrast, so that's not contrast. Could it be enhancement? Yes, but there's thickening there. 
you're uncertain, but look at the coronal view. Look how obvious it is there. You see the thickening of the G junction. You see that the strophic calcification. Mucinous adenocarcinoma, be it colon or be it stomach or be it ovary, often calcifies, and that's exactly what this was. Beautiful example of tumor at the GE junction. Now, when we look at the lymph nodes, the accuracy of CT will vary because one of the issues with gastric cancer, the nodes are very small. So depending on location and size of nodes, what our criteria are, the number of nodes, and perhaps the attenuation, that will affect our accuracy. This article this year by Sato, the, diagnac the Diagnostic Accuracy of Lymph Node Metastasis and Gastric Cancer, was improved by using individual cutoff values for each lymph node region. Okay, and so for example, they chose certain areas where you call smaller nodes, suprapancreatic region nine millimeters, a greater curvature region six millimeters. The diagnostic accuracies for lymph node metastasis using individual cutoff values was 71% based on histology and 76% based on region lymph node location. So again, you need to be more specific. In large nodes over eight millimeters in the short axis, are essentially always considered to be malignant, a very important rule. Now, when tumors are bulky like this, the nodes often are large, like you can see here. That's not a very difficult case. Here's, again, impressive celiac adenopathy. The celiac is the most common area involved. Here it looks almost like a pancreatic cancer where it infiltrates the celiac axis. To me, any node in the celiac with gastric cancer above 6 millimeters is considered abnormal. Now, it's interesting, nodes can spread away from the region. Here's a patient with a mass in the gastric fundus. It's interesting because this patient was, rep was sent to us to pancreas conference because they thought there was a pancreatic mass. When you look, the patient had nodes in the peripancreatic region from gastric cancer. So we looked and we said, okay, there's a gastric mass. There's nodes near the pancreatic head. There are also large left periodic nodes. So you can see how nodes will indeed spread. It's not just local celiac that can be periodic. They can be peripancreatic. Another example. Now, in this case, what you're looking at is not so much just the nodes by the celiac axis, but also local spread of disease. So we look at gastric cancer, we look at wall thickening, but also tumor can grow beyond the stomach. And you can see here it's infiltrating downward in the peripancreatic region. It can infiltrate down onto the stomach, so-called gastrocolic ligament spread. It can spread onto the pancreas. And these patients are obviously going to be unresectable. Another example here, diffuse infiltration by the antrum. You can see the retained food in the stomach. You can see spread of tumor beyond the stomach. And as you look at the coronal views, it's my favorite example of a gastrocolic spread. You see the tumor has grown down the gastrocolic ligament and goes directly into the transverse colon. So stomach to colon can occur. Colon to stomach can occur, but it's typically stomach to colon. A history of a patient who has really foul breath makes you think about the possibility of a fistula from stomach to colon. And you can see that very nicely on these images. Now, uh, a couple of articles, an article by Kim, adding NPR to transverse CT, improve the capability for distinguishing T3 from T4 lesions and predicting invasion. Combination of CT and multiplanar is more accurate than axial alone in predicting spread. And again, um, this is nothing surprising. You can't just look at axial imaging. Again, when you're looking at adjacent organs like fat plane, the coronals were particularly, particularly valuable. And so um, this article by Kim really becomes very important. And the reason this T3 versus T4, the preoperative prediction of T4 tumors, is important in determining the extent of surgery. Researchers in some studies reported that the combined resection of invaded organs increased mortality and morbidity without overall survival gain. So a T4, unresectable is the way to go. We also note, as in this case, infiltration of the stomach, linitis plastica, and ascites, carcinomatosis. Ascites and carcinomatosis are common. Or this case, gastric outlet obstruction, distended stomach infiltration of the antrum, carcinomatosis, implants on the omentum, implants,
uh, on the colon, very, very classic carcinomatosis. And gastric cancer is one of the classic tumors that gives you that type of carcinomatosis, nicely shown here. Now, the accuracy of CT in terms of invasion, serosal invasion, uh, with thin sections, as articles showed, it indeed to be very good. That multi-row CT in patients with gastric cancer is excellent for preoperative staging, especially given the high accuracy of CT for looking at serosal invasion in gastric cancer. When I look at pitfalls, we have to be practical. What can you miss? Small flat gastric lesions can be missed. It's difficult to determine depth of invasion, and it's also really hard with small nodes, to be honest. Now, when you compare CT to ultrasound, ultrasound is good for doing uh, guided biopsies, but CT is very valuable, particularly on the TNN staging of patients. Preoperative CT is still indispensable in the evaluation of distant metastasis. Therefore, a CT exam focused on the stomach and the upper abdomen uh, could probably replace endoscopic ultrasound if you were looking at ultrasound simply for doing staging. So again, it becomes very, very important. And this article, this recent article, talked about fused imaging from 3D CT to help plan resection, particularly in relationship to vascular anatomy that uh, CT was indeed very helpful in looking at some of the variations in vascular anatomy, which can be complicated when you're doing laparoscopic gastrectomy. So again, one more role of this complex topic is to look at CT in preoperative planning, not only for staging, but for surgical planning. Just like we do the same thing in patients with pancreatic cancer, uh, it really helps with laparoscopic assisted gastrectomy procedure. Now, when we look at gastric cancer, it's also important to make sure we scan down through the pelvis. Krukenberg tumors are not uncommon for gastric primaries. Large ovarian lesions, carcinomatosis are all possibilities. Now, in many cases, gastric cancer is kind of obvious by presentation, but the truth is it can look like other tumors from lymphoma to metastasis, perhaps from breast cancer with linitis plastica, but also it can look like inflammatory processes. So for example, this was a perforated benign gastric ulcer, but once you have perforation, you see the stranding around the stomach, you always worry about carcinomatosis. Also, if you have a gastric cancer that's perforated, you may tend to overcall because it's really not spread into the omentum or mesentery, it's simply the perforation. So indeed, you need to be very careful. When you have perforation, you could overcall the extent of disease that's present, which was the case here. This was a perforation due to a gastric cancer, but there was no carcinomatosis. It was simply secondary to the um, inflammation. And here's just a few more images which nicely show you exactly where the perforation is. Now when you get past gastric carcinoma, you look at lymphoma, and uh, the most frequent GI site of malignant lymphoma is indeed the stomach. Most cases are non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Gastric Hodgkin's disease accounts for about 9% of all gastric lymphomas, and primary gastric Hodgkin's disease is very rare. There are many risk factors for primary GI lymphoma, including celiac disease, HIV, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, and immunosuppression following organ transplant. For example, patients with celiac disease have a 200-fold increase in developing intestinal lymphoma. So again, there are certain risk factors. More than 90% of cases of malt lymphomas are associated with H. pylori infection. So again, the relationship of infection the tumor becomes very important. Transformation of malt lymphoma into high-grade lymphoma is also known to occur. When you look at clinical presentations of gastric lymphoma, again, it's somewhat of a challenge. Symptoms are nonspecific, but include abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting. GI bleeding may occur. Up to half of patients can present with palpable masses, but that's when tumors are really large. Rarely primary GI lymphomas can cause intersusception or obstruction or bowel perforation, but again, that's rare. Numerous studies have demonstrated that the stomach is the most common site of primary GI lymphoma, making up about 50% of all cases. Again, this association with H. pylori infection is indeed very common. One of the challenges with lymphoma, it can very much look like adenocarcinoma. 
the appearance is very variable from ulcerations to polypoid masses. When lesions get very bulky, then we really do typically think about lymphoma. It used to be five sodomias or greater was always lymphoma. Now, occasionally, uh, lymphoma can mimic a GI stromal tumor, a GIST tumor, but that tends to be very, very rare. To me, um, it's that diffuse infiltration, which, when not very bulky, looks like adenocarcinoma, but as this article by Cheng makes the point, it also can simulate other things from ZE syndrome to a gastric adenocarcinoma to ulcer disease. If you look at specific numbers, the classic infiltrating form of gastric lymphoma, that five centimeter range used to be, though we do pick things up earlier these days, so it's more like 3CM. Again, it can be polypoid. Adenopathy tends to be much more impressive with lymphoma than with adenocarcinoma. We used to say that if adenopathy went beneath the renal hilum, then it was lymphoma. Adenopathy up higher was more common uh, just with adenocarcinoma. So there is quite a spread of patterns of gastric involvement. And again, there is that overlap. Some rules that are helpful, the bulkier adenopathy, extension into duodenum, larger nodes, and fat plane preservation are all more common in lymphoma, though they're not perfect. Now, we have been seeing more malt lymphomas because of H. pylori infection, and the most frequent CT finding then is going to be wall thickening, and it can be a challenge. If I show you this case, and I say this is gastric adenocarcinoma, you would agree there's really not much nodes present. There's infiltration. It looks like some of the cases I showed you before. That was lymphoma. Or this case, infiltration, body, and antrum. I don't see a lot of bulky nodes, but the tumor itself is really bulky. And when you look at this level at the antrum, it's so bulky, you really have to think about lymphoma. Indeed, this was lymphoma. You can see this example in 3D with very nodular folds. With lymphoma, the folds are infiltrated, so there's decreased enhancement, but you can say the same thing with adenocarcinoma. This was very bulky. Here's another example. Very large, thickened folds. And lymphoma is the thought, but at the end of the day, I'll describe this as infiltration. Carcinoma is more common. I'll worry about carcinoma. I see some nodes, but I recommend this patient get endoscopy, and that's going to give you the right answer. So at times, I can be specific. Other times, I know it's a malignancy, and we move on from there. One of the things that we are seeing a lot of, and it's easy to recognize, are just tumors. We used to call them uh, leiomyosarcomas in the past. There's a number of different um, categories of describing them. They typically arise from a common precursor cell. Key things about them, they're CD117 protein positive, CD34 protein positive, S100 and Desmin commonly positive. About 70% of GIST tumors occur in the stomach, about 30% in small bowel, but they can occur anywhere in the GI tract, including esophagus and colon. They make up a small percent of gastric tumors, and about a third or up to a third are malignant, and the larger the lesion, the greater the chance of malignancy. Typically, 5 cm is a critical number. Over 5 cm, the pathologist will always say high-grade malignancy. Under 5, they still tend to fun for around to be very specific. The key thing is mitosis per high-powered field, for 50 high-powered field, over one mitosis tends to mean it's a malignant tumor. Again, even the non-malignant quote-unquote tumors will be resected and will be followed. The classic CT findings will be an exogastric mass with ulceration not uncommon. The tumors, when they get large enough, do enhance somewhat, but they're enhancing in an inhomogeneous type pattern with central necrosis. And when you have metastasis to the liver, which are the most common site of metastasis, they're often cystic and necrotic. When you look at the subepithelial lesions of the stomach, just is one of the lesions, but there's a long list. Sometimes the lesions look like this. They're well-defined and smooth. Statistically, it's a GIST tumor. Sometimes they grow outside the stomach and through the wall, very nicely shown here with an ulceration, nicely shown on 3D as well, okay? Classically, as I mentioned, GIST tumors are smooth, mildly enhancing, and exophytic.
as in this case. And sometimes you're not certain if it's something pushing on the stomach versus something arising from the stomach. But in this case, it's pretty easy. And sometimes the 3D is helpful. The lesions can become large. Is this the liver or is this going to be a gastric gist tumor? Well, when you look at all of the images, it's a gastric primary tumor. You can see some of the necrosis, minimal enhancement, very nicely shown here. And the coronal views can often be very helpful. One of the reasons it's important to recognize gist tumors is because patients can be treated with Gleevec pre-surgery, which will help shrink the tumor or make it necrotic and will give the patient a better chance of cure. Sometimes gist tumors are so large it's hard to tell where they're arising from. Almost looks like a sarcoma in the mesentery. But here it's mainly exophytic, it's necrotic, there's some wall enhancement. And when you start looking at the full sequence of images, you kind of begin to recognize. And I think by seeing a lot of these, I kind of recognize the appearance. Here's only an 8 centimeter lesion, smooth, exophytic, ulceration, some enhancement, classic for a gastrointestinal stromal tumor. Here it is on the sagittal view, very nicely showing you the ulceration. Here's another example. Sometimes they go directly into adjacent organs like the spleen. This patient ended up with a partial gastrectomy, splenectomy, and distal pancreatectomy. If I told you this was a primary splenic lesion like lymphoma, you might think about that. Occasionally, these lesions have calcification, though that's fairly uncommon. And they may have some vascularity, but that also, as you can see here, is relatively uncommon. The degree of necrosis will vary. Nice example here. And you can see, again, the large exophytic component of the tumor. I mentioned usually there may be some vascularity. Other times, like this massive 25 centimeter lesion, looks like it involves the abdominal wall, displaces bowel. I'm not positive it's coming from the stomach, but look how vascular it is when I show you the CT angiography. You know it's a sarcoma, the only question is the epicenter. And I think when I see these large masses these days, I tend to suggest it's a gastric primary. Now, most of the gist tumors I see are exophytic, but I mentioned some are intraluminal. Here's a large polypoid mass that's intraluminal, and that's a percent of just tumors. Here you can see it very nicely, like a big mass hanging off the gastric fundus with areas of necrosis. So this is the second most common appearance, but it is less common. I mentioned with just tumors, a surgical resection is the conventional therapy. Uh, again, depending on aggressiveness, these tumors will occur. Now the whole way of looking at these tumors has changed because of Gleevec. Gleevec is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, and it's standard chemotherapy, particularly for just tumors. Long-term survival uh, will improve. Gastric just carry a better prognosis than small bowel gists of similar size and mitotic rate. And in general, gastric gist tumors portend a better prognosis than adenocarcinoma of the stomach. Now, in terms of other tumors, I mentioned that gist can calcify, but they're rare. Lyomyomas are more common to calcify. But again, this whole area of lyomyoma and gist tumor tends to merge into one. Uh, this would be read as a low-grade malignancy. The patient would have a gastric resection and should indeed do very well because this, in fact, ends up being a benign gastric lyomyoma. Now, we can see other gastric lesions. When you look at this case quickly, the first thing that catches your eye is a vascular mass in the region of the pancreas, and I'm thinking of neuroendocrine tumor of the pancreas. When you look at all the images, you recognize that this is not pancreas, but this is actually large nodes that are vascular. And you look hard, there's actually a lesion inside the patient's stomach. That was a primary gastric carcinoid tumor which then metastasize to nodes. So small vascular gastric lesions, you better think about the possibility of carcinoid tumor. Here's another case, stomach well distended food. Look at that polypoid lesion, posterior gastric wall. It's only about a centimeter. Very easy to miss if you weren't giving IV contrast. Very easy to miss if you weren't giving good gastric distension. A very nice example of a carcinoid tumor. Really good example. Now, I mentioned before when I was talking about adenocarcinoma about the possibility of it looking like linitis plastica from breast cancer. 
It looks identical. And you think about the pattern of metastasis, the stomach, you think about linitis plastica, you think about nodules like melanoma, and even a solitary mass. So here's an example of a patient with diffuse infiltration of the stomach. It's cancer. And you might say adenocarcinoma, and you'd be right, but this patient had known breast cancer, this was biopsied, this was metastatic breast cancer to the stomach. This patient has a large mass, and I look at this mass, I say it's exophytic, I say this is a GIST tumor. Biopsy, suspected GIST, patient had metastatic melanoma. Okay, again, very tricky, kind of a tough call. Mass to the stomach most commonly arise from lung cancer, breast cancer, and melanoma. With melanoma, it can be multiple, but it's usually solitary, usually submucosal or serosal. Now, the other pitfall is this case. I've just shown you 40 minutes of cancer, and you would look at this and say there's an antral cancer here. Well, I thought so too. This was biopsy three times, and this was gastritis due, due to NSAID use. So at times, gastritis, particularly when focal, can be very, very confusing. Look at this patient's antrum. This to me looks like classic carcinoma. This was biopsied several times because to everybody it looked like carcinoma. Patient had weight loss, nausea and vomiting, nothing very difficult. This patient, in fact, went to surgery. This was gastritis with infiltration, ulceration. It was just basically totally inflamed. There's no way you can call this anything but cancer. Or in this case, look at the infiltration of the stomach in the body. There's not much, you know, it's low density, but to me it's carcinoma. This was biopsy. This ended up being gastritis. So there can be some confusion, and I will tell you, you're just not going to make the call. And when they have one biopsy, I still don't believe it. You need to have really thick biopsies. And sometimes patients have gone to surgery because it's just very difficult to make that diagnosis without really good tissue. Let me at the end close up with a few benign gastric tumors. Um, 80 to 90% of gastric tumors are in fact benign. They're small lesions, smooth muscle tumors like poma, polyps, neurogenic tumors. With good CT technique, you can see these small polyps. And you can see them again, key is gastric distension. Look how nicely you see the small polyps on the gastric wall. Or here you see a polypoid mass which ended up being an inflammatory polyp. So I think we're very good at picking up these small lesions, but this one, which is over a centimeter, I couldn't say this wasn't a cancer, and I worried about this being a cancer. You can see it very nicely in this set of images. Another example, what about this case? There's something infiltrating in the stomach that indeed is pretty impressive. What is this? Well, this was polypoid lesions in the stomach in a very unusual patient with Canada Cronkite syndrome. Amazing study, amazing, interesting case with gastric tumor, but again, a very rare process. We can see gastric lipomas, and they look very much like pomas of any other GI tract organ, the submucosal, usually gastric antrum. Occasionally, they can ulcerate, and it, when they're large enough, they can intersuscept. They usually easy findings of no clinical significance. Here's a lipoma in this example, or in this case with lipomas in the uh, patient's antrum of the stomach, as well as in the duodenum. So you may see multiple lipomas in multiple organs. You may even see multiple lipomas in the stomach. I showed you one case before of a potential pitfall. A patient with cirrhosis, I've mentioned in other talks, that with cirrhosis on arterial phase imaging, you can confuse varices with nodes. You also can confuse varices with tumor. So here's a good example, arterial phase cirrhotic liver. When you see what looks like a mass in the fundus before you call it a tumor, you better look at those venous phase imagings because almost always it's simply going to be very, very large varices. So you want to be very careful. Varices can be infiltrating. You can see lots of collaterals. You can really make a terrible mistake. You don't want to be biopsying varices. Patients can have obviously significant bleeding. So you want to look very, very carefully before you make the diagnosis. Other things, post-operative imaging, CT is very good. This patient had a antral cancer, had a resected. Good for follow-up, very nicely showing you the anastomosis, no local nodes, no spread of disease, uh, very nicely shown in that example.
or in this case where the patient has local recurrence. You can see dilated intrahepatic ducts, you can see spread into the left upper quadrant, direct extension into the spleen, for example. Indeed, very impressive and unfortunate recurrence. So CT is very good in patients with gastric cancer, gastric lymphoma, just tumors as doing follow-up. There's lots of interest in PET CT these days, and there's been some work looking at PET uh, with the stomach. Um, in this one article recently, limitations of FDG PET and PET CT in the diagnosis comes from three main aspects, the variety of histology of the different gastric cancers, physiologic properties of the stomach where it is common for increased PET uptake, and the spatial resolution of PET. So again, uh, their success was that CT was, was still going to be the study of choice for evaluation from an imaging perspective, and that FGG PET at best had a sensitivity of 76% for gastric cancers above 30 millimeters, but only 16% for those under 30. So the small gastric cancers, PET is not going to be good, and it's also very dependent. Most studies report that FDG PET had lower sensitivities in detecting diffuse type, mucinous adenocarcinoma or signet ring than intestinal type gastrointestinal adenocarcinoma. So again, uh, there are going to be limitations. Perhaps with time, those limitations will be overcome. So hopefully I've discussed with you and shared with you our experience in looking at the stomach. I've accentuated, hopefully, the importance of exam protocol. I've gone over some of the classic CT appearances of the various tumors. I've covered some potential pitfalls and some differential diagnosis points, and I hope you found all of that helpful. And with that, I'll say thank you very much.